I guess my question is, how do you advise juggling both with ease? Yes. Okay. One, Amanda, I love this question. And I think that it's something that more people need to ask. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven-figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. The first year going full-time as an entrepreneur can be stressful and exciting all at once. You answer to you and no one else. And if I know you, you're ready to make the most of your first 365 days as a CEO. That's why we opened up the Gold Digger podcast coaching sessions again. I am so excited to dig in with a first-year full-time entrepreneur. Amanda Rush Holmes is a Southern mom, an educator, and the founder of the Virtual Assistant Studio, a virtual assistant agency that helps female bloggers and influencers create content that converts. She's led dozens of women through her signature course, the Virtual Assistant Studio, where she teaches moms to build a profitable virtual assistant business so they can make a full-time income during nap time. Amanda is on the show today for a one-on-one coaching session to dig into first-year challenges that I know she can turn into growth opportunities. We're talking about selling and marketing different products and services, pivoting away from services to focus on digital products, what to look for in team members, and how to create boundaries for yourself and your team as a leader. Are you ready? Let's dive on in. Something I love about being a podcaster is getting the chance to support my network of fellow creators and business owners. Being Boss, hosted by Emily Thompson, is an exploration of not only what it means, but what it takes to be boss as a creative business owner, a freelancer, or side hustler. Being Boss is another amazing resource for anyone interested in getting inspired and more importantly, getting started. If you like Gold Digger, trust me, you are going to love Being Boss. Emily even covers topics that are near and dear to our Gold Digger hearts, like taking time off as an entrepreneur and finding vision for your business and life. Listen to Being Boss wherever you get your podcasts. Amanda, welcome to the Gold Digger Podcast. I am so excited to do this coaching session with you today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and just so honored to have been chosen. Oh my gosh. Okay. So fill me in on where you are at. When I read about your journey, I was like, okay, Amanda is the perfect fit for this conversation. And I just want to know a little bit more behind the scenes of who you are and what you do. And then we'll get into the questions. Yes. So I like probably so many other people out there actually started my business in the middle of the pandemic, (laughs) which probably seems crazy (laughs) to some people. They're like, wow, what a great time to start a business. But that's what happened for me. And it was a really unique situation. I had just been laid off from my full-time job, which I worked in retail. And you know, you come from a retail background, like you would never have thought in a million years that your store would even close, let alone like, you know, whole companies being shut down. And at that same time, my husband was one of the lucky chosen ones that had COVID. So we went from this two income household to no income. And I was thinking to myself, like, okay, I can do this. I have this amazing skill set. Like, let me just figure out a way to bring in some income. And I joke because sometimes I'm like, you know, I started my business on accident because I genuinely had no idea if you would have told me then where I would be today, literally just even talking to you. But I started freelancing. And one thing led to another. And 
Before I knew it, I had built out this entire virtual assistant business and it's called the Virtual Assistant Studio. And we're a virtual assistant agency that supports bloggers and influencers. And we also have our signature course, which teaches other moms how to build their own profitable virtual assistant business so that they can stay home with their babies and make a full-time income during nap time. And we're at this really unique spot where, you know, over a year in and we we started to cultivate a small team and the business is growing, but at the same time, it's kind of like, okay, where do we go from here? What's yes. next for us? What does the vision look like? So that's where we're at. Oh my gosh. I just want to commend you for taking action, even when you weren't sure what the next step was, because I think that's how so many of our businesses are built, right? But also figuring out like, where can you serve and stepping into that? Like, I am honestly blown away by what you've built in a year. I feel like it would have taken me at least five years to get to where you are. So I just want to just commend you for taking action, because I think too, when the world was facing such uncertainty, it left a lot of us just feeling like, where do I add value? And what is my purpose? And I think that you stepped into it, even when you couldn't really see what that next step looked like. And I just I'm so inspired by you. Oh, well, thank you. And honestly, I mean, even today, like I still have so many pinch me moments where I'm like, I get to wake up and do this for a living. And how cool mm -hmm. is this? And that's really what inspired me to build out the course is because, you know, I started sharing my story on Instagram and people are like, wait, what is this that you do? Like, yeah. like, who are you working with? This is so cool. Like, how can I do this? How can I stay home with my kids and still bring in income? And I think that was so apparent to you coming out of the pandemic where so many people were forced to be at home and they, it really made them take a look at their lives and say, do I really want to go back to, you know, an hour commute each way and committing 40 to 60 hours a week? Like if there's a possibility for my life to look a little bit differently, like I want that. And yes. we're giving people the ability to do that, which is just so inspiring to me every single day. Like when I hear stories from our students saying that we were able to change their life by, you know, one course, like that's so cool. And now they're able to show up in their lives as a better version of themselves because they're happier and they feel fulfilled and they're able to do something that lights them up. And I feel like that trickles over into them being a mom and a wife and a daughter and a friend and all these other things that they wanted to show up well in, but maybe couldn't because they were so bogged down by like a job that they kind of felt suffocated in. So mm -hmm. it's been really fun. Oh, amazing. Okay. So let's dive into the questions yes. and we will rock through them together. Okay, perfect. So as I mentioned, I am growing a small team. Uh, right now, I have one full-timer and two part-timers, and we're completely remote. So we're working with different time zones and different schedules, and some have kids and some don't. And that is my goal and always will be is for them to have flexibility. But with them mm -hmm. being remote, I feel like that also comes with its own set of challenges. You know, I come from a world where like your team was like there with you in person every day, like you knew you were going to see them. So I, my question for you is, how do you advise leaving them so that you're confident in their abilities and then they're confident in themselves to be able to make decisions on behalf of the brand just as good as you would, if not better? Mm. I love this question. And it's honestly kind of wild. So I have only ever had a remote team. I love working from home myself. And I have team members that are spread out all over the country. And I understand this struggle because it's different. Like when you can pop into somebody's office or share coffee or lunch with them, it's it's a very different experience. But it also brings about some benefits, like you mentioned, in terms of flexibility. So one of the things that I found that has been absolutely pivotal for my brand and for my team is allowing your team member to feel ownership of an entire process start to finish. 
that can be super hard at the beginning because a lot of times as the CEO or as the boss, we're only handing over tiny pieces of a process that someone can either do better for us or that we could do, but we shouldn't be doing. And so if you can find ways to give your team full ownership from start to finish, they're going to feel like they own this piece of the process, but it's also going to invite them to figure out new ways to do it or to experience or to explore. And so it's interesting when you're just hiring, because like you said, you have one full-time, two contractors. And so a lot of what they do is probably owning bits of the process, but not the entire one. And so I would just challenge you as a leader to figure out ways to give them that ownership of a piece of whatever they're doing so that at the finished product, they feel like, wow, I really did that. And it can be something that you can work towards. It's not something that you can just say, you know, today, all of a sudden, I'm just going to hand this entire thing over to you. Good luck. But giving people that sense of ownership really helps them to make better decisions because they see the entire project at play. The other piece of that too is that I would say that when you set up an employee, it's really cool to really encourage them to figure out and to allow them to kind of figure out different methods to do things. So like whenever we have a new team member, we'll say, well, this is how we've been doing it. Feel free to take the parts of this that serves you. But if there are pieces of this that you think you could do better or differently or that you want to try, feel free to do that. And I think giving that permission from the very beginning allows people to see gaps in the systems or allows people to see opportunities. And that encourages them to kind of make it their own process process, which again, circles back to that ownership piece. I love that so much. So I have a follow-up question to what you just said. (laughs) So in doing that, are you then having like a touch base with them or reviewing? Like, let's say that you're like, okay, let's go over this one SOP. This is how we normally do it. I would love for you to own this. Are you then asking for feedback? Does that look like a team meeting or a one-on-one touch base? Yeah. So we do a weekly team meeting, which was something that I was actually super resistant about for very long. I love the freedom of entrepreneurship and I'm the kind of person who hates commitments because I'm like, I don't know how I'll be feeling on that day. I don't know. But having team meetings has been really, really critical and letting other people into those processes. But I also would say that I've learned to give people 90 days to figure something out. So a lot of times like we want people to create their processes or their systems quickly or to adopt ours quickly. And I've just found that when we let people have that ownership and also have the time to kind of test things out and figure out their method, it works really well. So whether you do quarterly reviews or just check-ins, I'm talking to my team every single day on Slack as like our way of communication, remote work style. But I'm also giving them that kind of time and space without me breathing down their back of being like, how's it going? How does it look? What are you doing? And that way too, it's like they kind of can come with trial and error and be like, well, this is the way that's working best for me. And since a lot of people have that full ownership on my team, I don't really care how they get the end product. I want them to do it in a way that supports their own work-life balance and their own work styles. And giving them the freedom to figure that out, I think is just really, really critical. Did that answer your question? Yes, it answered it perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so we have two sides to our business. We have the services side, and then obviously we have our education side. And because the services side does serve bloggers and influencers, as you know, that world can be very fast paced. And that's kind of where we come into play is being able to support them on the back end so that they can focus on growing and scaling their business. But with that, I feel like the services side sometimes overflows and takes over from the time that we would love to be spending on the education side of our business. So I guess my question is, how do you advise juggling both with ease? Yes. Okay. I want, Amanda, I love this question. And I think that it's something that more people need to ask. So I always think about like, this is a really smart question. So, okay. A lot of people 
start out with the services side, right? That's where they gain their expertise. That's where they get the experience. That's where they create their blueprints, their strategies, their workflows that then they can pass on. And the thing about services is it is usually a game of trading time for money, right? We all kind of find ourselves in those holes when we're service providers. That's what happened to me as a wedding photographer. When I recognized that the only way to make more or to make a greater impact was to work more, (laughs) I realized that's the antithesis of why I became a photographer in the first place. And so one of the things that I think is so incredibly important when you are navigating both a service-based business, but also a business that can scale digitally, which is exactly what you're doing is to create such clear boundaries around the amount of service work that you are going to take. And I'm talking about like having a very black and white yes and no system of what your enough point is on the service side that's going to cover your income, that's going to cover your team's income and any overhead that you have and saying no to everything beyond that. Now, the beauty that comes with that is that if you are having to turn away people for the service side, one, it usually indicates supply and demand that you can increase your prices. But two, it also creates this opportunity to give you the freedom of time, which is required to grow that scalable side of your business, that digital side. And so a lot of times what happens, and I've seen this with my friends who are graphic designers, who are web designers, who are copywriters, who who play all these these service roles, but then they want to create that scalable aspect, that passive income aspect is that the service side takes away from their ability to focus on their own launch. Their serving of their clients takes away their focus from figuring out their own promotion. And so it's really, really important that you create boundaries, that you define that enough point that's going to give you the security that you need in order to free up your time, which is going to be the most valuable way that you scale that digital side. And I've watched one of my really close friends who is an incredible web designer. She's my web designer. She went from being this custom website builder to transitioning their business to this template shop. And now they are crushing it as a template shop, but that only happened when she started saying no to doing that custom work or that service-based work. And so I think just getting really clear on what do you need that the service base can bring in, but then how do you free up time so that you can give your launches the same time and attention that you're giving to your clients? Yes, I love that advice. And I think it's hard to say no sometimes because... So hard. (laughs) When we're in the services side of the business, I feel like there's a little bit of that people pleaser in us where we love to serve and we want to help all the people that inquire with us. So saying no, I think is sometimes a challenge. But I love what you said about setting boundaries and really looking at the whole picture. And I think that's sort of where we're at right now is I feel like we're in a great spot where we can Mm -hmm. hit pause on taking in new clients and really focus in on the students that we do have. And then how do we continue to serve them and any aspiring students and diving into what that's going to look like, which is so fun and exciting because I know that the potential's there. It's just a matter of sometimes like sitting down and doing the work, you know? Mm -hmm. Wait, I have one idea that just popped into my brain. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. One of the coolest opportunities that you have is that you get to watch your students take your program and implement, right? So you could also be watching for opportunities for people to join your team. So if you are looking at expanding your team, either on the services side or expanding in a way that would help support the digital side, you get to watch your students transform and and you'll see those outliers, those people who take action, the people who understand, who get it, who, who create results. And so you could also be looking at your program as this way to see if people might be a good potential fit if you decide to grow the service side or like the agency side of your business, which I think is kind of cool. It's almost like you're you're getting this behind the scenes look at if somebody might be a fit. And if you do decide to continue growing your team, you're giving people this look into your values and culture as a company and how you do what you do, which is kind of awesome. Awesome. 
Yes. It's so funny that you said that because I have a folder in my inbox of probably 30 names of people who have reached out that said like, I want to work for you. Yes. <laughs> We're a student and I'm like, okay, I'm going to save this for later yes. <laughs> because I feel like yes. this is going to come in handy. So with that then, what are some things that you look for in your team members to be able to identify if they would be a good fit for you and your team and your company culture? Yeah. So, okay. People are probably going to roll their eyes at this, but so much of my hiring is intuition and gut based, which I know is not always the most helpful answer, but I have sat in boardrooms with people who hire these people to find talent and, and these talent scouts and these agencies and all these things. And I want to make sure first that I like the person and second, that they're teachable and trainable, that they can be resilient and adaptable as they learn a new position. A lot of my team members who are literally incredible at their jobs started in a totally different role or had experience that could definitely support their position, but wasn't fully aligned with the work they're doing. But because of who they are and their attitude and the life experience they bring, they have grown into the most incredible team members. So for me, my hiring process is a little bit obscure in that I definitely look for experience in terms of the position I'm hiring. So I search keywords to make sure that they've had some sort of experience or that they understand the world that we're in. But I also really look at like my gut, like who do I remember? Who stood out to me? Why am I still thinking about this person? I move really quickly when it comes to hiring, which isn't normal. I don't make people take 8 million assessments fill in 8 million questions. I don't have time to look at all of those responses, but I ask myself, is this someone who I'd want to hang out with? Is this someone who I know is going to show up? Is this someone who buys into the mission of what we do? And I think too, given that you have like these people who are excited and and offering, like, I want to work for you. Do you have any positions? It gives you this opportunity to step back and really look at like, well, what are their skill sets and how can they support this vision? And I think for you, Amanda, what you're going to find, especially after this first year of business is right now you're doing two roles. You're the visionary and the integrator. You are the person casting the vision for the company, but you're also the person doing a lot of the things. And so a hire that's probably going to change your life is when you are elevated to that role of visionary where you really get to steer the ship and and figure out where your focus is going to be and how you're going to show up. And you get someone that's really supporting you in that integrator role that's helping manage the team and the projects and stuff. And it's going to be hard given the industry that you're in and the experience you've had. But finding that right-hand person can just absolutely transform everything. Yes. It's funny because I feel like the term integrator has come from other industries and it's something that our industry has probably needed for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I definitely agree. Finding that right-hand person is going to be key to unlocking like the scalable success because you're right. Like at the beginning, we are obviously wearing all the hats. We're doing the marketing and the client services and the communication and the team coordinating, which is, I think, kind of necessary. Like I feel like you almost have to go through that so that you know the ins and outs of your business. But I love the idea of putting that sort of like on the goal list, maybe for next year of like a really good hire. (laughs) Yes. Amen. Amen. I love that. So what was the the biggest turning point in your business where you felt like all the pieces just sort of started clicking together? I would say without a doubt, when I recognized that my time was more valuable than money. And here's what I'll say about that. And this is something that I think can happen to a lot of us. There are different times in your career where money is the most important factor, right? We're willing to exchange our time to earn more money. We build things like service-based businesses where the only way to earn is to exchange our time. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that's a lot of times it's a necessary first step. But for me, the biggest change happened when I recognized that I would rather make less money in order to get back more time, time to just be a human and to live and to be joyful and to be with family. And I think that when I recognized that and when I made 
a really big decision to cut back on my service-based business. I literally cut it in half. I was making six figures and I was like, I was happier when I was making 50K and we ate a little bit more ramen noodles for lunch. That was when I freed up time to really ask myself those questions of like, what am I passionate about? Is what I'm building sustainable? Can I see myself doing this in five years? Do I want to be doing this in five years? And so every single time in my business, when I've made the decision to either trade money to get back time through either hiring or getting contractors or getting help, or just in the fact of like, I'm okay with making less money as long as I'm hitting my enough point in order to get back my time. That has been the greatest shift in my life and in my business. And I think that's what's made me fall in love with entrepreneurship. And I think sometimes it takes hitting that burnout state for you to come to Jesus to recognize that like what I'm building is not sustainable or like this isn't necessarily making me happier. And so when you get to that place where you're like, my time is so valuable, not because I'm special or because I'm gifted or because I have all these talents that other people don't have, but because I want to live my life more that changed everything for me. And that opened up a lot of doors of possibility because I was finally passionate or curious enough to explore different things. Yes. And I feel like the magic happens when we give ourselves the time and space to be able to like think about something other than like the 50 million Mm -hmm. tasks that are in our task manager. And it's interesting too, because so we're expecting our second baby in the new year, which we could not be more excited about. But with that, as a female, you have so much that goes through your mind about preparing your obviously yourself and your family, but the business too. And I know you talk a lot about boundaries. What are some ways that you create boundaries for yourself within your business, but then also allow your team to do the same thing so that they have that same feeling of fulfillment, but also balance in their life where they can still do the things that they want to do and also still love the job that they are doing at the same time? Yeah. We've been through so many adventures together from the first episode to now over 500 episodes. Growing the Gold Digger podcast, I can't help but see the similarities between how I grew up too. The first day of school feelings, the awkward braces years, and the excitement for what's next. And I know I'm not alone here. Growing a business takes a lot and a HubSpot CRM platform is here to help your business grow better. HubSpot's reporting dashboard is like your crystal ball, giving you this bird's eye view on your marketing, sales, and customer service performance so that you can get ahead of any issues before they happen. Automated marketing tools allow you to create robust campaigns across all of your marketing channels, and you can even send, test, and optimize emails for different devices and inboxes. And shared inboxes make incoming chats and emails easy to manage and scale for the whole team. Learn more about how a HubSpot CRM platform can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. I can't believe I'm saying these words, but I wrote a book. I keep thinking that the more that I say it, the more real it's going to feel. But it's truly been this surreal experience working on this massive project, especially since I said I would never do this. Never say never, right? Well, there's this amazing story behind the book, how it all came together with the encouragement of a massage therapist and seeing a mouse and how I managed to write my heart out in secrecy over the last few years. My first book is called How Are You Really? And I would love to share all of the behind the scenes with you before it's out this summer. I sincerely hope you'll join me inside of my Insiders Club so that you can take this book writing and launching journey alongside of me. You can join right now at jennacutcher.com slash book. That's jennacutcher.com slash book for the insider scoop about how are you really? I can't wait to share this book and this journey with you. I'll see you on the inside, gold diggers. So company culture is huge. And I think it's it's crazy, one, to even use those words, company culture, because a lot of times when we're hiring and stuff, it doesn't feel like we're building a company culture. We'll, we're just like taking care, like triage style of like what needs to get done. And all of a sudden you wake up one day and I remember just being like, 
oh my gosh, I have 10 team members. Like I'm responsible for like 10 families incomes, like all of these things. And I am responsible for setting the tone of the culture. And if I want balance in my life, I have to promote the fact that my team also deserves balance. So we have very, very, very strict guidelines in terms of phone use for work. So what I mean by that is I do not expect my team to have their emails or Slack on their phones. If they want to have it, they can. However, it is not a requirement and I will not text them unless something is actually urgent or an emergency, which is literally 0% of the time, pretty much. We have to ask permission to text each other if that is a way that we want to talk to each other or communicate. And we have to wait till we get permission in order to do that. And why I do that is because at any given moment, I could be on Slack talking to my team member and Coco could come barreling into the room and want me to read a story to her. And if somebody's texting my phone or I'm hearing the dings of notifications, it pulls me out of my life and it pulls me back into work. And so having that autonomy to flip-flop roles really quickly, which is something that I think a lot of us had to manage when we were all working from home during the pandemic, or for people that have always worked from home, is giving my team that same grace and permission to do that. So I think the first way is just really having those boundaries around, here's when I need you to be on, here's how I'll communicate with you. And if something is an emergency, I'll call you or text you, but it's not the expected way of communication. It also makes you not so anxious to pick up your phone thinking, oh gosh, I'm going to be reminded about that email that I forgot to send her this is so-and-so trying to get a hold of me to do work and it's 10 o'clock at night and I should be going to bed, but now I'm going to crack my laptop open again. The other thing too around that is that we love to work ahead. So we really work from a place that there is very, very little urgency. And I think that that just one helps stress levels, but two, it kind of gives us this perspective of like, we can do all the things that we can in our control and there will be things that go wrong or things that aren't perfect. But when we're working ahead, it gives us that brief breathing room to really assess and evaluate before things are going out into the world that helps us to make fewer mistakes, but also less stressful decisions. Yes, absolutely. I feel like giving yourself those hard boundaries, I think it was probably if I could imagine hard in the beginning, because for our team, we're so used to like text message and everything's on the phone. And so all the apps we use and all the things But I think about as you were talking, I'm like, okay, what would that actually look like? And I love the fact that it would allow them to just log on during their working hours and they would have that really like uninterrupted work time where they knew, okay, this is my time to get things done. I'm not going to have to worry about so-and-so texting me, like you said, at 10 o'clock at night, which can be stressful. Or even if it's at seven o'clock when you're trying to put your child to bed and you're like, oh no, I have to answer this email right away. And just giving them that space. And I know you and your team have been together for a while. What are some ways that you guys have grown together as a team? And what advice can you give to help encourage that growth? Oh my gosh, we've grown so much. So my first team member was hired, I believe it was like seven years ago. And in a decade of business, I've only lost one team member due to life circumstances. And otherwise, every single person has stayed with me for years, which I just think is such a blessing and such a testament to hiring off of your intuition and and hiring people that are resilient. And my team is just incredible. So one of the things that we do, like we had a team call yesterday and we don't just talk about work. We talk about life too. And I think that feeling like we are invited to show up as our whole selves and not just our professional or formal selves really invites in a connection that is so much deeper than just being workplace coworkers. So, you know, letting people into my marriage or Coco will jump on a call with us or you know, sharing about my pregnancy or things like that really gives people permission to share about what's going on in their life and world. And I think it allows us to support each other on a human basis, not just a work basis. Another thing that was so cool was we did our first team retreat And it wasn't really work related. Like I bought the team, I flew everyone out first class and I got them all massages and we sat by the pool and it felt like we were at a bachelorette party, to be honest. And just having that FaceTime and that connection point, we did a little bit of work and and vision casting, but very little. 
it was really a cool way to help us connect in person and to help us to kind of refresh on like what people's skill sets are in a way that encourages us to work together instead of working in silos. Because for so long, I just gave my team such ownership of their process that they never really crossed over a ton. And so I felt like after a team retreat, it was an investment in this ability to cohort projects together or to lean on other people's expertise. And that's something that I cannot wait to bring back once travel is a little bit more normalized and everything is set for that. So I just think that allowing our team to be human and to check in on a lot of our conversations are like, how are the kids or how is your dad's health or how's the new puppy or all those things. I think that it just encourages people to be themselves. And I think that when we can show up to work as our whole self, as a human, it really helps you feel purpose and belonging in a way that's like impossible to feel if you're only showing up in a professional setting. Yes. And I feel like that can get so lost just in the virtual nature of our business too, because yes. <laughs> we we are so spread out. So then mentioning like, oh, this is what's going on with me today kind of seems like, why are you telling me this? But yes. it's important because having that level of connection also lets you in on how they're wired and how their brains think and what's important to them. And I feel like that'll give you a good indication too, as to like, where they're going to grow in their role and maybe if they might be a good fit over here versus over there and and things that just you may not have even thought of too. And it's funny because my team and I have only been together for um, six months. So that's not that long. However, in our short time together, I can already tell like, okay, this person loves to work at like 5 a.m. And this is my night owl. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And recognizing those patterns and, you know, okay, it's three o'clock. Like she's picking up her kid from school right now and like Uh knowing those little things I feel like is just so helpful for me too but then for the business and it also like helps me to be able to then delegate things with like client load and just sort of trickles into a little bit of everything at the same time. Yes. One thing too, that is like a shift that was so dumb that it took me so long to understand. Marissa, my integrator is so good at this where every single morning she'll start off with like a question of like, how'd you sleep last night? Or like, what'd you eat for dinner? Or like something like that, where it's like, she starts off the conversation, non-work related in every conversation that she has in a very natural way that allows you to be like, I'm a human first. And then we dive into work. And I used to be so bad about that. Like I'm the kind of person where I just like get straight to business is just sometimes how my brain fires. But I'm like, oh, it does feel good to like hear good morning before we dive on into the tasks. And so she has inspired me so much where I'll like type out a business thing and then I'll like backspace, 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 like, hey, how are you doing today? And then we get into the stuff. And it's just such a simple little shift. But I think that in doing that, it kind of just kicks off every single day with just kind of a new light of like, oh, here's what we're doing now. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny because we do a lot of voice texts, which my family yes. totally makes fun of me for. They're like, what text. are you doing? I'm like, it's a thing, I promise. And well, I feel like that's like the best way to connect too, is like, I mm-hmm. love hearing like their kids in the background or they're making dinner, but then they're, we're also chatting about like, you know, non-work things, which is just fun. And I sometimes miss like that connection piece. I would never trade entrepreneurship for anything, but you know, it's nice to have like that sense of connection. Yes. Amen. So shifting gears a little bit, I guess, obviously being a virtual assistant agency specific to bloggers and influencers, I feel like it's sort of a new concept. In a lot of ways, I feel like we're new to the market. And then in some ways, I feel like not so much because obviously a virtual assistant has been around for forever. But with that, I feel like comes a lot of growth and sometimes growing pains. How do you manage that with your business, that exponential growth of making sure that the business is continuing to move forward, but also making sure that the wheels don't fall off? Yeah. I mean, exponential growth is such a gift, right? Like you are asking that question in a way of like, holy crap, I can't believe this is the question, which is so beautiful. Again, I think it comes down to boundaries and bandwidth. And so 
one of the things that I think can really easily happen and even thinking about like your life and circumstance as a mom and like why you started this in the first place, it's really easy to feel like we like jump on the roller coaster and it just keeps looping and there's no opportunity for us to get off, which is such a blessing, but also not really serving our values of why we started in the first place. And so one of the things that I would just really assess is checking in with yourself. Like, am I feeling too stretched? Are there ways that we could systemize things to simplify? Do we need to cut back or like limit what that looks like? And I think a lot of times we fear that like, if we hit the brakes, we're going to forget where the gas pedal is. So let's say your next round of your course, you just say, you know, I can only handle like my capacity is just having 25 students this time. I know I could probably sell 50 spots, but I think 25 is my bandwidth. You have to trust yourself that like one, when you serve those people even better, or give them more time and attention, they're going to get better results. They're going to be that proof and that testimonial that you're looking for. You also have to recognize like, again, so much comes back to like, what is your bandwidth and like, how do you scale responsibly? Really? I think that I just recently was recording an episode about how to scale a business. And it was like, you have to figure out like all of the kinks in your system and make sure that it is like a well-oiled machine before you throw gasoline on the fire. And I think the wheels only come off when you throw gasoline on the fire, but you don't have that streamlined system. So I always like, we, let's say, before we automate anything, like we do it live so that we can work out all the kinks. Then we work through feedback. Like we literally write down, here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. Here's what we forgot. Here's what we were urgent about. Here's what felt stressful. Here's what felt really good. And then we take a little time away from it and breathe before we do something more, whether it's putting it into automation or backing it with ad dollars or things like that. So I would just say scale responsibly, look at your terms of bandwidth of like, what's an honest look of like, what can I actually handle? And just trust yourself that when you are ready to throw gasoline on the fire, you can do just that. But by hitting the brakes or by limiting what is asked of you, you're not going to miss out on anything. In fact, you're probably going to have a better experience. Yes. And in the spirit of throwing gasoline on the fire, (laughs) what sort of (laughs) strategies do you feel like would be best or that you advise implementing, maybe thinking back to like your early days in order to help you continue to move forward? Yeah. So I would say a lot of like organization is huge. And I know with your VA background, you're probably far more organized than my creative mind ever was. But creating like processes so that things can be duplicated and replicated. Before I had my integrator, like we weren't working on a project management software. We didn't have like a framework surrounding, like I knew all the things that needed to happen, but I was also the one making them happen. And so I would say kind of what you brought up earlier, SOPs, standard operating procedures, workflows, things that then eventually you can hand off to that right-hand person can absolutely transform things. And then also making sure that you're not doing so much that you don't have time to step back and analyze and look at your results. So I feel like for years, I was just always on to the next thing that I never really paused to say, okay, what could have been better? Or what should we do next time? Or how do we make this more exciting? Or where did we mess up? And so that is now a very big part of our process, even though there are so many moving parts, but really taking time to analyze and to celebrate your results. I feel like that gets lost in the shuffle too. So just figuring out, you know, we're really good at creating systems for other people or for our clients or in our service-based side. But a lot of times we forget how to do that for ourselves in a way that serves us in the future. And so systems and stuff like that can make such a big difference. And it took me way too long to get organized and systemized in order to duplicate the results that I was getting. Yes, I feel like systems are always necessary. They're like the foundation of the business, but they're also equivalent to like 
going to the dentist where you don't really want to do it, but like right. you know that you should. Yes. <laughs> it's like, okay, let me sit down and make this appointment. <laughs> so I know you had mentioned taking a step back and really analyzing and looking at things. What does that process look like for you? Are you doing that with your team? Or are you asking for feedback from your audience or maybe a mixture of both? Yeah. So it's definitely a mixture of both. So we have now a template, blessed templates, where after we finish a launch, every single team member that was a part of that launch has questions that they answer. So like, what worked well? What didn't work well? Were there any things that made me feel urgent or stressed? Did we forget anything? What would we change next time? And what's so cool about having that is a lot of times you'll go through a launch or a process and you're like, I will never forget this. Like It's kind of like motherhood where you're like, oh, I'm never going to forget this exact day. And then like two days later, two hours later, you're like, I already forgot it. Like it's a blur. And so having all of that down on paper, then to lean on going into the next launch or the next time you launch that same thing. So we do it as individuals, as individual contributors to the launch, but then we usually review it together too. And a lot of times we share the same takeaways. Things will feel similar to us if we forgot something or if there was urgency or if there's something that we thought we could do better. But having that as like a blueprint for the next time we do that project has just been so invaluable because we forget things all the time. And especially if you're launching once a quarter or once a year, you want to make sure that you have that information so that it triggers your memory to do it better the next time over. And then we also do pull our audiences often and just especially if they've been through a launch with us and they ultimately decided not to purchase. I just think that it's such valuable feedback to understand why they made the purchasing decision that they did and to support that decision, but to gain that insight if there's something on our end that we could do differently or do better, or if it was just circumstantial or timing based or the right fit. We want to make sure that we're serving people and that that experience is positive. And so just simply asking afterwards can be really valuable. Yeah, I feel like that feedback is a lot of what's guided us, even if it's just like an Instagram direct message of somebody saying yeah. or a few people saying, you know, Hey, I would love to learn about this. Or do you have a resource for this? I'm like, Oh, no, but let us create one for you. Mm-hmm. And going off of that, I know, obviously, you've spoken about value ladders, but then also at the same time, like tying your offers back to your core community and your audience. What advice do you have on finding like the quote unquote right offer for, you know, your audience? I know some people say it's best to just focus on one offer and scale that. But if your audience is asking for something else, do you dive into that or do you focus on what you have existing? Yeah, so I think... It's different for everyone. And I, you know, like one of my best friends is Amy Porterfield and she has two courses and one of them is like her signature course. And she just does one massive launch for that each year. And then my business is different where it's like we have four courses and we launch one per quarter and they're smaller launches, but we're serving different segments of our audience. I would say that starting simple is the best place to start. And then figuring out too, where do you add value or how do you continue that puzzle, like putting that puzzle together for your your clients? Like all of our courses, if you were to buy all of them, build together to create one system. So none of them contradict each other. Like they don't compete against each other. They're very specific. They're very niche and they're very step-by-step how-to, but they all work together so that if somebody was to take one program and then take the next one, it's not contradicting or competing against each other. It's just building the bigger system. So I think it's one looking at bandwidth and like how you want to spend your energy, whether it's smaller launches more frequently or bigger launches where you put tons of energy into it. But yeah, paying attention to your clients is so huge. And then really asking yourself, am I the right person to do this? Or maybe someone else is already doing this really well and I can be an affiliate for them or connect my audience to them. I think it's one of those things where it's like, yes, you could do a lot of the things you're being asked to, but is it the right fit for you? And that's where really discernment and intuition play a huge role in helping you craft the perfect offers. Yes. 
And I think we have time for one final question. Okay, perfect. I know your business has ebbed and flowed and you've had different pivots. What's been your biggest aha moment as an entrepreneur? So honestly, and I think if I could be a vision caster for your future, Amanda, I think the biggest aha moment was stopping the service-based business to do the scalable business. And it's not something that happens right away. And I think being in the service-based business equips you, teaches you, helps for you to understand how to do the scalable business and how to teach it in a way that allows other people to do what you've done in the service-based business. So definitely don't give up that side. But looking as a fortune teller into the future, the Amanda that I could expect to see three to five years from now is more focused on the digital scalable side of helping other people do what she built with the services side because it really does give you that freedom. It allows you to make an impact that is bigger than just trading your time for money. But it also puts you in this position to really live the life that you wanted when you started all of this. And I think you definitely have to pay your time and your respects in the different stages of business. But for me, looking at the life that I have now as a mom and what we've built and the freedom that we have, the freedom of choice and choosing how I show up and work and what that looks like, wouldn't have been possible had I stayed in the service side forever. Okay, that's so exciting and also encouraging to hear because I think it can be kind of scary to think about leaving the services side of the business only because it has been like the bread and butter for so long. But I do agree, like casting forward, I feel like we have some really exciting things ahead of us. And our goal is really to be able to help as many moms as possible. And I know we can do that with the educational side of our business. So it's really encouraging and also exciting. (laughs) Hey, Amanda, where can everybody find out more about you and what you do and learn about your program and learn about your business? Give us all of the places. Yes. So I am in all of the places with the nature of my business, but everything is the virtual assistant studio. You can come hang out with me on Instagram. I'm there every day (laughs) and visit my website. We've got all kinds of fun free resources for you. Amazing. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for letting me coach you on air. I hope that this was super valuable for you. This was so much fun. This was so much fun. And thank you for having me. Oh, I forget how amazing coaching sessions are. I hope you love tuning in as much as I love hosting them. I'm so blown away by Amanda and the success she's found in her first year of business. I know for me, it would have taken me years to get to where she is today. But I hope that in her questions, you found answers that you might be seeking out. If you ever want to be coached on air, I highly, highly encourage you to make sure you are following along at Gold Digger Podcast on Instagram and join our Facebook community of insiders by going to golddiggerpodcast.com and clicking the link to join our private Facebook group. It's totally free and it's where we offer the opportunity to be coached on the podcast and I want to make sure you don't miss yours. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. And of course, until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 